Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Digital Naked Faith. This is our digital worship service for October of 2021. We are back after our summer break, and we hope all of you had an excellent break, and we're excited to be back for another year. As you can see, we're continuing with our online format for the time being. However, this may change as the year goes by, and stay tuned to our social medias for updates on that front. Before we get started, I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7 in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising of the Siksika, Pecani, and Kainai First Nations, as well as the Sutina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bears Paw, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. For those who may not be familiar with us, Naked Faith is an alternative worship service aimed at youth and young adults, but open to everybody who'd like to participate. Every month we aim to put on a service which both pairs music we are passionate about with a theme that hopefully connects with you on some level. If you're watching the premiere of this video, uh, we always follow it up with more content over on the Naked Faith Instagram. Uh, it includes past live streams and we just chat about the theme and overall have a really great time. And we're excited to be back again doing that uh, after our break. My name is Josh and this is Andrew. Hi Josh! And uh, we will be your hosts for this video. Well, well, well. How the turntables. This month, our theme is flipping tables. Uh, the, our theme this month is an introduction to the overarching theme this year of social justice. With all the turmoil in the world, it's easy to feel overwhelmed. This year, we want to discuss the hard topic of social justice by addressing the issues, recognizing and naming our shortcomings, and discussing how to engage in social justice, hopefully making the world a better place. Flipping tables, as many of us know, comes from the classic story of when Jesus and Judas were playing Monopoly in that one temple. Remember how Judas bought all the blue properties and he hiked up the price of rent? Oh, Jesus was so mad when he landed on Park Place and had to pay all his money. He lost and he flipped the heck out of that table. And from that day on, Jesus and Judas were friends off. Isn't that right, Andrew? I mean, that was pretty close, just a bit more of a modern interpretation. The story that we're referring to is when Jesus visits the temple of Jerusalem and he finds there's tables of merchants and money changers all in the courtyard. And he gets upset and starts flipping tables and drives them out, saying something to the effect of this is a house of prayer and a house of worship, not a house of trade. And so this is a, a very well-known, popular example of Jesus walking the walk, standing up to a perceived injustice. And so we wanted to base our theme off of this this month, this starting point for a year of exploring social justice issues. Uh, I like my version better, but I get how that's more applicable. It's easy not to know where to start in all this. It's hard sometimes not to feel lost. Our first song touches on that idea, feeling lost in a sea of uncertainty and finding comfort in embracing the unknown. Here is Sailboat by Ben Rector, performed by the Naked Faith Band. I feel just like a sailboat Don't know where I'm headed But you can't make the wind blow From a sailboat I have seen the sun Felt the rain on my skin and found 
closely I've been waiting Oh, I'm out in the ways and I'm open and praying Please let this wind blow me home And night after night there's an empty horizon My God, do I feel so alone Sometimes life And most times I feel just like a sailboat Now I'm pretty sure I'm hurt Least I know I'm speaking But I feel like a fool, yeah So I can't hear you listening Ooh. But I'm not giving up, oh no I'm gonna move on forward I'm gonna raise myself God knows what I'm headed towards And most times I feel just like a sailboat Only change I see Lost or found at sea The only difference Believing I'll make it in Most times I feel just like a sailboat Part of flipping tables is understanding why the table needs to be flipped. Sometimes Recognizing and naming the problem is the hardest part because we can't objectively see the problem. This month, we are focusing on the ideas of privilege and self-reflection. Privilege is often hard to see, especially when you're someone who benefits from it. We're defining privilege here as the benefits and advantages, noticeable or not, granted to some and not others based on factors that are completely out of people's control. So why is privilege so hard to talk about? Well, it's become a bit of a buzzword. It's a big theme in memes and comedy, but it's a serious issue that needs to be addressed when we're talking about social justice. Privilege is a part of a system that oppresses people. And maybe when people with privilege are called out for it, there's incongruence when your feelings don't match the situation. And you might become ashamed or embarrassed about potentially being oblivious to the current situation. But pointing out privilege isn't about making people feel guilty. Although it can be interpreted that way, which may be the reason people react negatively. For the most part, it's about acknowledgement and taking responsibility where we can. It's the classic example of running a race. We're not pe saying people didn't work hard for the things they have. I'm sure folks run their hardest, but what we don't realize, or maybe what we don't recognize, is that the people that were running the race with us 
started 20 meters behind us. Privilege allows those who benefit from it to be many steps ahead to begin with. Recognizing privilege also then means recognizing oppression. It puts us in the position of, ha of having to experience the other, other people, those who are disadvantaged. It means having compassion for those different than we are. How we approach our differences is very much up to us. And acknowledging privilege plays a huge role in dismantling the system that holds other people down. And we owe each other that. So, where do we start? Well, it starts with us. Again, it's not about guilt. Guilt is associated with blame. And blame is past tense. We can't change how things have happened, but we can change things from this moment forward. It's so easy to get defensive, to put up walls when we're called to reflect on the parts of us that we aren't proud of. For many, privilege, acknowledging privilege, comes with a lot of shame. And I don't believe anyone in our community would actively work towards the oppression of others you know, just so they could get ahead. It's not who we are called to be. Instead, this acknowledgement is a time for growth, for learning, to become better. We often acknowledge that we aren't perfect. However, why don't we then put in the work to become better? It's important that we take stock of the people we are, the people we want to be, and the kind of world we want to live in. None of this is easy. And maybe at times we've justified reasons as to why we didn't speak up, stand up, shout out when faced with injustice. But to speak out against injustice isn't a luxury. It's a duty. And it, it begins when we look at ourselves, at society, at the world and its injustices and say, enough. Part of exploring our faith is looking at what does it mean to live the way that Jesus lived? If we take him as our example, what does it mean to follow that example? It's asking the question, what are we called to do? What is our responsibility? And that's a big word to use, responsibility. Often in the United Church, we more want to ask questions, explore, unpack, figure out what does it mean to each of us to live with faith? And that's all still true. But at the same time, I think in exploring social justice issues, we need to take a stronger stance. We need to look at this idea of responsibility. There was a wonderful article written by Pastor Keith Marshall that made the rounds on social media recently. And our very own Reverend Nick Coates from Red Deer Lake United Church preached on this same topic recently as well. And both of them point to a couple really interesting things that I think are pertinent for our theme. First of all, they talk about what Paul wrote in Galatians, in that God calls us to live a free life. But that's essentially saying that's not a free pass to do whatever we want. It doesn't mean that we get to put our wants above the needs of others. And so we actually have a responsibility to put the needs of others, to put the needs of the most vulnerable first. Secondly, they talk about Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, where he essentially says to live like I live, to follow me, you need to feed the hungry, care for the lonely, and protect the most vulnerable. So once again, outlining very clearly that our responsibility is to care for the people in our community, to protect the most vulnerable, to help out those that are oppressed and being harmed. And like Josh said, I think a big part of it starts with ourselves, of reflecting on asking ourselves hard questions, like where am I not doing enough? Where could I be saying more, doing more? because the reality is we could all probably do a little bit more. The point is just to ask those questions that sometimes are uncomfortable and hard and questions that maybe we want to avoid answering because it means looking at some of our growing edges, some of our weaknesses. But that's a really important step because we are called to not idly stand by. We are called to have a responsibility to care for those in our community. And caring takes action. 
So it's time to start thinking about what that action could look like. Flipping tables. Mm -hmm. um, so. <laughs> 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 Uh, you know, we kind of got to a great point, which is, you know, I'm here because of my expertise in diversity and inclusion. Queer, uh, I, I identify I'm, I am uh, cisgender, uh, white, lesbian. But I'm also obviously a visible minority. I, I have a lot of intersectionalities uh, in, you know, in my life in terms of yeah. whether or not there are places at the table for me. Because there's something called intersectionality. Right, so privilege exists in different contexts, different circumstances, and based on your history. When we talk about flipping the table, whether it's uh, this dismantling, you know, this uh, you know rough throwing of the table, or whether it's flipping the table, changing it around, whether it's making the table bigger, what we're really saying for me is that. We're taking a look around, we're seeing who's at the table, and then we're asking ourselves, oh, who's missing? Yeah. And well, hopefully we're doing that proactively, right? So we're leaving enough chairs empty, right? We're saying, hey, listen, uh, we know we're here, but we're going to make sure these chairs are empty um, so that people who feel like they're on the outside don't have to fight their way in, right? To flip a table, I think, means that you see that there is a point You've been polite, you've been patient, mm -hmm. you've been respectful, but the time for that is done. And so anytime we're flipping the table, we're basically saying, oh, uh, we've closed this off, let's open this up and let's make sure that nobody feels hurt, harmed, or has to really go through anything tough to get, to get a seat at that table. And, and I'll speak from a queer, pers uh, from a queer perspective. Um, I get a kick out of National Coming Out Day. Like there's so many things about us, right? We, that we have to tell people in order for them to know us. Why this doesn't feel safe for me or this doesn't feel right for me. I come out every day and every day it's that, <sighs> do I just sit there and quietly go, mm-hmm. Yeah, today is not the day. Today is not National Coming Out Day for Cindy. I'm just going to be quiet. Flipping tables, it's when it's like, no, this doesn't work anymore. This does not work. And it, it shifts. Rather, for me, what Christ does when he flips those tables, it's the message I don't have to change who I am to sit at that table. For me, it means getting to that point where no, no more. And it could be anything from as little as like, am I making sure that everyone on my soccer team feels included, right? To as large scale as making sure the governments are hiring on parity with equity and equality. And then in this case, the churches as well, right? I don't feel like you're asking me to do the work. You know, I'm here because of my expertise in diversity and inclusion, but I'm also obviously a visible minority, right? And uh, whether that brings in a level of uh, experiential expertise, uh, you know, I think that's useful in some ways with, you know, I have the academic background, but also the experience of not being invited to all these tables. I, I've been at this uh, lesbian thing most of my life. And I, <laughs> and I know, yeah. <laughs> all my life and I know who I am and I'm well supported I like you the wonder about about that right and so and so yes I can go to those tables and start flipping them on good days there are some days. days I'm not up to it there are some days where something is said or and I just kind of shrink a little bit it hasn't really been a choice right and I didn't even know it wasn't a choice. And for some of you listening, you might feel that way too. You, you probably didn't even realize you weren't invited to things until you started to miss out on those things. It really makes me think of my own experiences at the church, being like a minority or person of color, mm. 
uh, working for the church. So in some ways, it was amazing that I even got hired, if you think yeah. about the history of the church, right? And um, so, you know, the United Church does such a good job of being so open-minded. And that being said, and I don't think it's anyone's fault, but just walking down the pews and knowing that I'm like one of the only persons of color and not being, we didn't have these conversations back then. This was what, almost mm-hmm. a decade ago. Uh, and not know what was wrong, but something did kind of feel a bit off. And so I think, I think most of us have an experience of other. And so when people ask me to do work like this or to talk about this, I like to keep in mind that, that I'm not, you're not asking me to do work for you, you're asking me to do work with you. Um, but I think that discomfort and to, you know, the, the metaphor of the story, you know, uh, when Jesus had to go talk to those merchants, that's an uncomfortable conversation. Mm. It's never going to feel easy. Yeah. Um, so, but that discomfort, you know, restlessness and discontent are the first steps towards progress. But one of the things that, let's say, um, you know, the privileged culture right now, which is uh, heteronormative, white cultures uh, want to look at minorities and ask them, like, what do we do? But I think you probably know what you need to do, right? You probably need to look around um, in your personal lives and go, hmm, am I actively making friends with minorities? Am I avoiding certain areas? Do I try ethnic foods, right? Like, how, how are you putting yourself in discomfort? Uh, yeah, no, like th- there are certain, there are certain things that, that I kind of shy away from. And, and that's, you know, when someone invites me to the table and, and then, but then says, you know, yeah, and we just want you to talk, but we don't care if, we don't care if you're a lesbian, you're invited no matter what, you know, and the same thing with saying, uh, no matter how you identify, or regardless of who you love. And I'm like, I don't know what the, the solution is, the long, uh, the large scale solution, the long term solution, but I think the first step is taking a good hard look at that and seeing how maybe to this day we might be complicit in it. It should matter how I identify. You should, you should want to know where that beautiful, beautiful reflection of a, of a multiple and diverse God, so expansive. And, that, and here's the thing, it's not, ev- it's not gonna be something you're gonna change overnight, but it is a dedication, right? Mm-hmm. It's, like a, it's like, I'm gonna be dedicated 24 hours to the awareness of it, so that when it comes up, I can go, oh, maybe I am a little biased here. So one of the tables I'm at right now is in this, in the mental health world has something called intersectionality, right? So privilege exists in different contexts, different circumstances, and based on your history. For me, for example, I'm a brown man. So the brown part of me makes me underprivileged relative to the white culture, but being a man makes me overprivileged relative to, you know, the female perspective and looking at some of the biases we're infusing from both perspectives, which is making sure that women have a voice, women are hired, women are put into leadership, women are trusted with money and funding and all those things, right? Uh, But on the flip side also of making sure there's room for the masculine voice in mental health, which is often, you know, uh, as you might know, as a man suppressed and uh, men have to be stoic and can't be emotional. I guess the table I'm sitting at is the patriarch table. Mm -hmm. And what we're trying to flip is the patriarchy in some ways, right? Yeah. Um, Structure. Structure, structure, structure. I think, uh, you know, and those tables that are in the story of Jesus going into the temple, those tables represent hundreds and hundreds of years of tradition of how you get to God. Those tables need to go because we need church, but church is no longer accessible. We need to be accessible. And accessibility is not just about ramps. I'm not just talking about physical accessibility. I am talking about accessibility for folks who are coming from a world that has changed.
Yeah, and I think when we think about the the church, it's kind of like that too, right? Start in your local church, start asking these questions, look around your youth group and be like, how come there's only white people here, right? Or how come there's only people of this socioeconomic factor? How do we invite other people? How do we broaden our horizons, you know? For people who are approaching the church in this time, those of us who are already there, we have to be willing to let go. We have to be willing to let go of what we've always done and put our faith that if we put God at the center of it, there will be a table. It's just going to look differently. It's been a privilege to dismantle privilege. Mm. <laughs> so it's, it's, I've seen so much hope, love, so many people feel seen for the first time in their lives that I can't imagine doing anything else, whether it's professionally or personally. But also ensure that you have some support if you're going to undertake flipping tables, mm -hmm. um, you know, because working for change, um, working for change can take a lot out of you. And I feel like our friendship has gotten closer when we've had those conversations too, right? And I think ultimately dialogue is so important uh, when we talk about dismantling or flipping the tables. Don't forget to laugh. Don't, don't forget to look for those blessings in your life uh, because even though it gets so heavy sometimes there are some really awesome things bye bye <laughs> <laughs> okay stop recording Holy One, we who are made in your image, we gather here tonight. We who are lacking nothing because we are gifted through your grace, we gather here tonight. And we gather here tonight with one another and in your presence, longing for affirmation, desiring connection, working together to honor and heal and sustain all your creation and praying for all those who seek these things as well. Because we are your creation, meant to be just as we are, meant to be celebrated, to be affirmed as your beloved children. Open our hearts and our minds to you, O oh, holy loving parent, and to one another here in this space and time. As we hear your word, pray together and call on your name so that we might be encouraged and go and go out feel empowered by one another to head into the world to love others to dare to love ourselves to flip some tables to go out and to love as we have been loved by you let all god's children say amen we are so excited to be back with everyone and we hope you're excited to be back for another year of Naked Faith. We're looking forward, as the year goes on, to explore some of the topics that really challenge us and our worlds. This month, we hope you go out and reflect on the potential privileges in your life. Have the tough conversations with yourself and those around you. Challenge the ideas and systems that keep people down. Because we can make a difference. And it starts with recognizing the problem. Thank you to everyone who makes Naked Faith possible, to Leanne for organizing the community video, and to all those who participated, to Brenda for all her work behind the scenes, to the Naked Faith band for all their hard work, to Andrew, my co-host, Joanna for being his wife, and Charlie for being their incredibly large baby. And thank you guys at home for tuning in. We hope you'll stick with us this year as we continue online and hopefully in person soon. To send us off, here is Waiting on the World to Change by John Mayer, performed by the Naked Faith Band. See you all next month. Bye-bye.
heart. Ugh. I forgot how to speak over the summer. 